to this the crowd? Has anybody went up the mountain to pray one himself? And here we see Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is God, and yet he prays. The importance of prayer. Why? Because you have human nature. And for human nature to be full, to be healthy, to be wise, to be radiant, to find its meaning, is to pray. There are a lot of things we do in life. That we exercise, we talk, we clothe ourselves, we feed ourselves, there's all kinds of things. But the most essential thing for the human being is to pray and to be in communion with God. And so Jesus, having assumed our human nature, the human nature of the God in Jesus Christ, it necessitated for him to pray. And so he who is prayed to is the one who prays. He prays to the Father, but he prays on behalf of the cross, and that's what Jesus was doing alone in the mountain that night. He dismissed the crowd. Well, what was this crowd? If you remember from the Gospel last Sunday, that this crowd was a crowd of the 5,000 that were there in the wilderness. That they came, they followed Christ, he didn't call them there, they followed him into the wilderness. He taught them, he healed their sick, and at the end of the day, it was evening, they had a problem because there was no food. They found out that there were five loaves of bread and two fishes. And the Lord said, that's the name of the people. And so on that evening, our Lord gave thanks to the Father and distributed the five loaves and the two fish. He broke the bread in different parts and gave it to the twelve disciples. The twelve disciples, they went and they gave this bread and this fish to all those that were gathered. There were 5,000 men, excluding the women and the children, as the Gospel says. And so more than 5,000 people were fed by five loaves and two fishes. When the apostles had that fragment, that piece in their hand, they would distribute it, and miraculously, more bread would appear in their hand. And so the 5,000 were fed by this multitude of breads that miraculously appeared in the hands of the disciples. Then our Lord said, well, let's not waste anything. If there are any fragments left over, let's collect them. And as it says the gospel last Sunday, they collected 12 baskets of fragments. And so this is the setting in which this gospel account begins. And our Lord bids them to go. He says, I'll take care of the crowd, I'll dismiss them, you go on the other side and meet you there. And so it's evening already, and probably now it's later in the evening, maybe it's 9, 10 o'clock, something like this. And so the apostles they get in their boat and they go. And when they're in the middle of the sea, as it says, the Sea of Galilee, so three to four miles out, as the Apostle John says in his Gospel, that they were buffeted by the strong waves and the wind, that they couldn't progress any further. And they were fearful that their boat, that it might sink. They didn't know what to do. And so they were there, and they were rowing and rowing. And it says in the Gospel, in the fourth watch of the night, that means between three and six o'clock in the morning. So already they're there some six, eight hours already, trying to cross the sea. It's only eight miles wide, the Sea of Galilee there. But they couldn't cross it. Now why didn't they come back if the wind was so contrary? Well, they didn't come back because they heeded the word of their master, cross the sea. And it would perhaps in their mind be safer to come back, but they didn't do it. But at the same time, they didn't do it, but they were frightened. Now it doesn't say in the Gospel that they called upon the Lord in prayer. But they were frightened Apostles in that boat. And then our Lord, knowing their fright, that he comes to them. He could have appeared just in the boat. He doesn't do that. He could have calmed the waves and the wind. He doesn't do that. But what does he do? He has more fright to them, and he's walking on the water. And they're even more frightened by this. They're already afraid of the, of the wind and the sea, and, and now they see this figure walking on the water to them, and they're even more frightened. And it says they cry out. It doesn't say they prayed, but they cried out. They, they were full of anguish. This was a moment of uh, trial and tribulation for them. What does the Gospel say? That when they were at their extreme, it says that our Lord immediately said to them, immediately he said to them, in other words, when they reached the limit that they could reach, that the Lord knew, He said, be of good cheer, it is I. Don't worry, it is I. Be of good cheer. And he comes into the boat, and as soon as he comes into the boat, two things happen. It says that the winds, they diminished immediately, 
And in John's Gospel, it says something more. It says that the boat immediately found itself at the shore. So for the next three, four miles that were supposed to be going across, that the boat miraculously appeared at the shore already, according to St. John's Gospel. Now, why did our Lord do this for the apostles? Why did he allow them to go into the sea, knowing that this would be a, a, a night of terror for them, as it were? Well, the Lord did it to test their faith, to put their faith to the trial, as it were. Now, trials and testing come from God. James, in his epistle, says, count it as all joy when trials and tribulations come upon you. Well, who would count it as all joy when trials and tribulations come upon you? Well, if the Lord is with us, then we can count it as all joy. St. Paisius, the Aconite, he says, in all trials that are given to you, Say to God, thank you, Lord, for this trial, for this was necessary for my salvation. And so trials, testing by the Lord, is a good thing for us. It's not a bad thing. The circumstances could be very nebulous. It could be very straining. It could be very full of anxiety. But nonetheless, that the Lord is there, and he doesn't allow us to have the trial and the testing beyond the measure of our faith and strength in him. And so he was he asking for the apostles to do something that they couldn't do. But he expected them to do something. Why? For two reasons. First, let's go back earlier on the Sea of Galilee again. There was another time when there was a storm at the sea. And the boat was beginning to sink, it says. And Jesus was in the boat, and he was sleeping. And they were beside themselves, the apostles and said, is it of no concern of yours that we're sinking here? Wake up, do something for us. And our Lord said, you're a little faith. And he rebuked the winds and the storm, and it immediately ceased. And the apostles said to each other, they said, what kind of man is this? That even, even the winds and the sea obey this man. And so they should have thought before. They should have thought of what happened before to them. That they called upon the Lord. Is it no concern of yours? We're sinking, help us. But it seems they didn't do that. They didn't resort to prayer. It doesn't say they resorted to prayer. But that faith experience should have persuaded them to have confidence and to call upon the Master, and they didn't do it. The second thing was only hours before, hours before that the apostles in their hands, they were feeding 5,000 people, and this bread and fish was miraculously being multiplied with their hands. And so they should have understood that this was the master of creation, that he had extraordinary powers because he was God. And this should have been fresh in their mind, and their faith should have been increased. But we see that the apostles were in the boat, and they were fearful. And when they saw the Lord walking on the water, they saw him with eyes that were full of fear. Not eyes that were faithful eyes, not eyes that had faith in the Lord. And so our Lord was testing them. Did they pass the test? Yes, they passed the test. Why? Because at the end it says that they said, truly, this is the Son of God. And they worshipped him. So the first time in the storm of the sea of Galilee, they said, what kind of man is this? And the second time, they gave themselves the answer to that question, that this is the Son of God, and they worshipped him. And their faith was made strong by that. Now in Matthew's Gospel, unlike Mark and John, there is the story of Peter. Peter's only in Matthew's Gospel. And Peter, seeing the ghost walking on the water, and Jesus says, it is I. Peter says, if it is you, bid me to come to you. And Christ says one word to Peter, come. And so Peter, he gets out of the boat. Now the waves are still there, the wind is still there. But Peter has faith enough, and we should ask ourselves what kind of faith we would have in such a circumstance. Peter has enough faith to get out of the safety of the boat, to put his feet over, and then to start to walk on the water. <coughs> and every step Peter takes is a step of faith, of real faith. You can be in 
please don't walk on the water. It's not our nature to walk on the water. And Peter, because of his faith, he's walking on the water. And he's doing a pretty good job until one thing happens. His eyes were no longer focused on the Lord, but his eyes and his ears were attentive to the wind and to the sea. And what happened? He began to sink immediately. He began to sink because his eyes and his attention was diverted from the Lord. When our eyes and attention is diverted from the Lord, we begin to slip. We begin to slip in our lives. But Peter, he does a wise thing. What did he do? He says, the short prayer, Lord save me. And we would say, Lord have mercy. Lord save me. And then what's the gospel say? It says, immediately, immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand to save Peter. Now Peter, he had a choice. He could have stretched out his hand to Jesus and had faith in Jesus, or he could have swam back to the boat, which a human experience would say it would be safer for him. But he doesn't go back to the boat. His faith is increased. And he reaches his hand to this figure, this ghost, as, he, as it says, Jesus, and Jesus pulls him up. And then Jesus brings Peter and himself back into the boat, and everything is over. In our life, Jesus puts us to the trial. The trial is a good thing. The trial could be anything that we would deem bad. It could be breaking up a friendship. It could be loss of a loved one, loss of a job. It could be betrayal. It could be poverty. It could be sickness. It could be uh, anything and all kinds of things that create tribulations and difficulties for us. And in that instant, what we need to do is what Peter did, is that we have to use our faith. It might not be a great faith. And then indeed our Lord rebukes Peter. He says, why did you doubt when you have little faith? Why did you doubt? Why did you vacillate? Why did you waver? Why did you hesitate? You could have walked. You had the faith, but you hesitated. You didn't follow through on the faith. And so for us, we might say in our lives, Peter had great faith. To get out of the boat, to walk on the water, that requires, we would think, perhaps great faith. But our Lord says, you have little faith. That's not enough. But you could have, you could have had greater faith. And so it's the same thing with us. There are temptations that come. The temptations that come are to destroy our faith. Temptations come from the devil. Or as Apostle James says in his epistle, temptations also come from our passionate human nature. But they come because our mind and our heart is not in the right place. And so a lot of temptations that befall us is because of what's in our heart and in our mind and in our soul. So it's not always from the devil. But temptations can destroy us. But even in temptation, what are we called to do? To do the same thing as in the time of trial. The trial was sent by God. God permits the trials according to the measure of our strength. He will never allow us to go into a trial in which our, our faith is not sufficient for us to endure and to improve ourselves by that experience. Temptations can destroy us, but in both cases, trials and temptations, what is our response? It's a response to be in the presence of the Lord. The apostles on the sea, they heard his voice, it is I, be of good cheer, don't worry, it's I. Peter heard the word of the Lord, come. In other words, come, don't worry. You could walk on the water. <coughs> In other words, it's the presence of Christ. We might not see his hand. We might not hear his voice. But certainly in our experience of our souls, we have to feel the presence of Christ in our life. In the most difficult, the most serious of situations that we could encounter, Knowing that all these things, that they test our faith, they increase the measure of our faith. That morning when the boat got to the shore and the land of the Gennesaret, the apostles were different. Peter was different. The other eleven were different. Their faith was strengthened. 
Well, of course, he wasn't perfect in faith yet. At the time of the crucifixion, only John the Apostle's there. At the time of the Passion, Peter, who walked on the water and witnessed all these miracles and everything else, his faith still wasn't perfected. What does Peter say? I don't know the man. I don't know him. I don't know him three times. But he denies Christ. His faith later was strong. And it's the same thing with our faith. We don't understand our faith very well sometimes because we say, I have faith. Well, what's that kind of faith we have? The kind of faith we have sometimes is saying, I believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty. And I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church. I believe this. I believe that in the creed. Well, that's doctrinal faith. That's good. It's important. It's extremely important and necessary for our salvation. But the other is what we call dynamic faith, a faith that moves us, a faith that says not only I believe in God, but I believe God. In other words, that God will act. God is present in my life, and he will do things, things that I think are impossible for me to understand and to do. The Lord says if you have faith enough, you can tell the mountain to throw itself into the sea, and it will do it. The life of St. Mark the ascetic, that he, he's quoting the scripture there, and the mountain begins to move. He tells the mountain, no, no, this was just hyperbole. It didn't mean for you to move. And so the saints did wonderful things by the measure of their faith. And sometimes we think we have faith. God bless us, we have the holy orthodox faith, yes, the good doctrine, orthodoxy of the right faith. But it's not enough. In other words, we need to walk on water. Not literally. But we need to push our faith and to have such faith in God that in those dark storms of life that we have, in those trials that we have, that we sense the presence of Christ in our life. So often we don't do that. It's like the apostles there. If the apostles were in the boat and they said, Lord, you're on the short brain for us. Help us now for six hours. We've been struggling against the, 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 the waves here in the sea. Nothing's happening. We, we think we can perish. Do something. Come present. Be with us. Help us. But they didn't do it. And they just fell into the pattern of fear and helplessness. They didn't understand that their master, the one who loved them, is mystically with them. And the one who loves us is mystically with us. So let's learn from this gospel account today that in the sea of life, that we need to take those faithful footsteps upon the water as it were. And to understand that with God, everything is possible for us. And that God is with us because he's the God who loves us more than we even 